2001 A Space Odyssey is one of the most complex films ever made. And still to this day, nearly 50 years after its release, most people are still baffled by it. I follow a lot of the discussions and articles about the film online where people are trying to interpret the, the movie. I look at the discussions on the forums and people are just totally confused. A hell of a lot of people try to fall back on the issue of the novel, and that's the first of three issues which uh, are a problem for people with this movie. Stanley Kubrick hired Arthur C. Clarke to write the novel. Uh, so the novel was written as the film was being shot. Most people don't realise that. They think that the novel was written first and that the movie was based on the novel. It wasn't. Now, while the shoot was going on, Kubrick did something a little bit sly with Arthur C. Clarke. He only showed him certain rushes uh, from the production in progress. And there were a lot of scenes that were shot that were then scrapped. And some of those scenes ended up in the novel and they are very, very different to what happens in the movie. Uh, another thing is that there are certain scenes that ended up in the movie that Arthur C. Clarke was not privy to. So basically what you end up with is a novel which is very different to the film and I believe Kubrick did this deliberately. I think he deliberately misled Arthur C. Clarke into writing a novel version that is very, very different to his film. And I think part of the reason he did that was to make his movie have its own life uh, so that people couldn't just go, oh, I'll read the novel and then I understand the movie and that's it. No, the movie has got its own meanings, it's got its own story, it's separate to the 2001 novel. And Kubrick even made a statement to that effect in one of his interviews. Uh, I'll try and hunt that quote down and put it up on the screen for you now. The second reason that people get very confused by 2001 is because there's not a hell of a lot of dialogue in the movie to explain things. We're used to watching movies where plot points uh, and even the emotions of characters are simply stated outright in dialogue, so we don't have to really interpret it. It's all just told to us, uh, to the effect that basically you, you could probably just read a transcript and get everything that's in the movie and the visuals are just a sort of like a pretty wallpaper to go with the script. Uh, 2001 isn't like that. Uh, I think it's the first 25 minutes of the movie has no dialogue at all. You don't get any dialogue until this scene. And then the final 23 minutes or so of the movie has no dialogue again. And that doesn't even include the end credits, which go on for about eight minutes. So right away there, you've got approximately an hour's worth of the movie that has no dialogue. And even in between those first and last lines of dialogue in the movie, there are huge chunks of runtime, several minutes at a time, that have no dialogue. So what Kubrick expects us to do is to look and listen and not expect things to be explained. He wants us to observe for ourselves and figure it out for ourselves. And the third issue is complexity. Most movies are very uh, simplistic in terms of their base themes and most of them have themes that are basically common to other movies. Most movies follow a thematic formula already laid out by previous feature films. 2001 doesn't do this. It has its own unique set of themes which I don't think had existed uh, in any other movies prior to 2001 being made. So it's unique conceptually, but it's also complex. There are a lot of layers to its meanings. Now an essential step to solving any particular puzzle in life is that you have to know what pieces you're working with. When you open a jigsaw puzzle, you know exactly how many pieces are there and you've got all the pieces on the table. It's simply a case of combining those pieces until you figure out how they all slot together, how they all click together. With a movie like 2001 A Space Odyssey, it's like a game of Cluedo. You first have to study the movie and find the pieces. Only after you've found those pieces can you then piece them together and figure out what the movie is really about. So that's a huge stumbling block as well. People aren't used to playing detective with movies and having to find pieces. And that's where this video comes in. I'm not going to try and explain to you in this video what I believe 2001 is all about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the movie chronologically 
I'm going to point out to you various things, little subtle things that happen throughout the movie, which in some cases are so specific that you can't deny that they are basically puzzle pieces uh, in terms of the movie's conceptual structure. By the way, I've also switched off the comments for this particular video because I want each viewer to take the puzzle pieces that are shown in the video and think about it for themselves. I don't want people rushing to the comments section to try and explain it all to everybody else uh, or to try and seek out the answers without thinking about it for themselves. At the end of the video, I will tell you where you can go to read my more in-depth interpretation of the film or to see some of my other movies about the, the film. But I recommend that you first soak up like a sponge all of these puzzle pieces and chew on it, you know, let it sort of reside in your mind for a little while and find out what little cross-references happen between those clues. You might figure out some things for yourself without having to go and uh, look at somebody else's interpretation directly. So let's go through chronologically. After a big chunk of music is played over a black screen for three minutes, we get this opening shot of the moon followed by the earth and the sun, all aligned and emerging from behind one another. But in order to see a sunrise like this, we have to be viewing them along the equatorial region. In other words, we're looking at this arrangement at a 90 degree angle. The camera rotated a perfect 90 degrees. Going to the first landscape shots of ancient earth, we get another sunrise sequence, but it's shown in a succession of still shots the sun emerging in stages initially from the top of a hill. In the following ape scenes, the leopard's eyes shine brightly in both of its appearances. When the monolith appears to the apes, the sun hasn't even risen yet, but after the apes touch the monolith and we jump to the low view, the sun is suddenly high up in the sky, rising from behind the hill or mountain-like structure shaped out of the monolith. Then the apes are eating meat and we get another shot of the sun at the apex of a hill. Lots of sunrises and sunsets. After the fight which ends with an ape throwing a bone we get a very weird piece of editing. The bone goes up spinning anti-clockwise and comes down spinning clockwise before we cut to the first view of a satellite. It's an unbelievable continuity error. And that weird editing wasn't necessary. They could have just cut it like this. Also, look at the bone-shaped protrusion on the first satellite. Now with all these shots of satellites and spacecraft that follow, these man-made objects are shown to us in flat 2D forms that simply scroll across the screen. Some of them shrink or bloat up in size, but there are no lighting or perspective changes. The lighting of the Earth and Moon in these shots sometimes blatantly mismatches the lighting of the satellites. And there are no continents on the Earth in any of the shots, and Earth isn't rotating. The moon here should be grey, but it's as blue as the Earth. Also, grab hold of your own copy of the movie and pay close attention to the symbols and insignia on each of the satellites. Oh, and there's another sunrise shot slipped into the sequence too. Then we get the view of the centrifuge and suddenly the 2D satellite perspectives have shifted to what is definitely three-dimensional movement. But like with the spinning bone, this centrifuge reverses its rotational direction between shots. And still, no continents on Earth. Pay attention to the control panel details here as well. Jumping ahead a bit, Floyd has a general chit-chat with some people on the centrifuge and is quizzed about a communications lockdown at the Clavius base on the moon's surface. The Russian guy appears to slyly give Floyd the middle finger. There's also a continuity error here in that a woman's sweater disappears from her chair between shots. But, a couple of minutes earlier, a tannoy voice announced that the same sweater had been found. As a matter of fact, I've reserved a table for you in the flight room. Oh, fine, thanks. It's uh, been about seven or eight months since you were here last week. Well, let's see, last June? Yeah, about eight months. Mm. I suppose you saw the work on the new section when you came in. Hey, you're coming along great, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. 
Oh, wait a minute. Mm. I can make a couple of phone. In other words, there are deliberate continuity errors in this film, or the film is somehow aware of its own continuity errors. Next, Floyd is on his way to the moon, and while he's asleep, a hostess is watching a video on jiu-jitsu, a martial art in which one uses the enemy's strength against them. Toilet instructions appear on a monolith-shaped display, and in the exterior shots, Earth has no continents again, there's lots of bad continuity regarding the size and lighting of the moon. And instead of being its usual flat grey, the moon appears in a range of colours. The severe lighting errors continue. Here, see the direction that the Earth is lit from. Well, the astronauts themselves are lit from directly above. You can tell by their shadows on the ground. Total mismatch. Cut to inside the pod, and Earth is lit from the wrong direction. The pod goes into the moon base, and we can see that these people in the corner are walking around in full gravity. Now you may think that they have on those grip shoes like the woman had earlier in the space flight. But when Floyd goes to the council meeting, everybody's walking about in full gravity, again with no grip shoes. This is supposed to be on the moon. The surrounding white walls here are cinema screens, you can tell by the curtains. The flags are swaying in a room where there shouldn't be any wind. And the photographer has a suit design and shiny cufflinks on his wrists, reminiscent of the leopard's eyes in the opening scenes. Floyd gives a speech in which he seems to be talking about the discovery of alien intelligence, yet never actually states it, and no one in the room acts surprised at all at the news, which has colossal implications for the human race if that's what he's actually talking about. He talks of the demand for secrecy, then asks if there are any questions, and the only person who asks a question is the guy he was already chatting to when he was sat down. Seems like a bit of a staged debate. In the moon bus on their way to the excavation pit, Floyd and friends, after all their talk of secrecy, chat openly about their unknown origin discovery and they say all this stuff out loud and within hearing shot of the pilots. They also eat synthetic food throughout this whole conversation. When the moon bus is landing, take a mental note of the visual clues in the computer displays, and how they relate to certain other scenes in the film. Now the excavation. We can see that the sun is right on the horizon here, but it's off screen, so it's another sunrise basically. And at the end of the scene, we get that sunrise over a monolith perspective mountain again. The sun has leapt right up into the middle of the sky like it did in the scene with the apes. In the pit, pay attention to the red and yellow machines placed at either end of the mirrored layout. When Floyd walks around the monolith, we can tell by these machines that he actually flips across to the other side of the monolith. Pay attention also to the precisely timed lens flare arrangement here. Onto the Jupiter mission, where the details reveal that the centrifuge changes its direction of rotation several times while Poole jogs around it. The two astronauts, Bowman and Poole, then watch TV interviews with themselves on monolith shaped display pads while they're eating fake food. We're also introduced to Hal, whose eye is positioned within a monolith shaped rectangle. 
An amusing detail here is that the interviewer appears to be looking off screen right at Hal, who is positioned in his line of vision as if he and Hal are here in the same room. In this same scene, we also get a close up of the emergency revival procedures for the crew in case their life supports are cut off for some reason. Keep that in mind for later. And it's stated that when crew members are in hypersleep, they don't dream. That's another one to keep in mind for later. Skipping ahead a couple of scenes, Hal lies about the chess game moves in order to persuade Poole to quit, and Poole falls for it. Queen to bishop three, bishop takes queen, knight takes bishop, mate. Uh, yeah, it looks like you're right. No resign. Then Bowman talks with Hal privately, and we start to get some weird behaviour from Hal. Hal is asking weird questions, and Bowman quickly breaks through this rouge. I know I've never completely freed myself of the suspicion that there are some extremely odd things about this mission. You're working up your crew psychology report? Of course I am. Sorry about this. And then Hal suddenly becomes stuck for a moment, a few moments, which is like an eternity in his machine time, as he desperately scrambles to deal with this awkward situation. It's then that he announces, or lies, that there's a fault in the antenna unit. Sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. Just a moment. Just a moment. I've just picked up a fault in the AE-35 unit. Next up, Bowman heads out to replace the faulty unit. For some reason, there are spacesuits in several colours. I've never seen that before with space missions. So he heads out in a red suit in a pod that is designed very much like an eyeball, and it emerges out of eyelid-like doors. Floating across the void, he presses a button on his console, and look which company name is on the console. Interesting designs on the antenna here too. So, it turns out there's nothing wrong with the unit that they replaced, so Hal either had made a mistake, or was lying. The bad news is delivered by this fella, and the manner in which the reception of the screen shuts off reminds me of something later in the film. Bowman and Poole head off to try and have a surveillance-free discussion in the pod. Note the bizarre movement of the window frame here. In the pod, they discuss possibly shutting Hal down, and it appears that Hal is lip-reading. However, lip-reading, according to the literature that I've read, is extremely difficult to do from a side view. There's a line of dialogue here that's important too. Look, Dave, I can't put my finger on it, but I sense something strange about him. Well, Bowman almost put his finger on it earlier. Now we get an intermission. Then Poole is apparently attacked by the pod, which we can assume is being remote controlled by Hal. But the attack isn't actually shown, we're allowed to assume an attack took place. Poole seems to be dying from lost oxygen, and then a weird shot has Poole and the pod pass each other in straight lines. But how could they pass each other at these angles when it was just a few minutes ago that they were in close contact and Poole had already floated off quite a way already? Bowman now heads out to fetch Poole's body. Note the displays on the panels with relevance to something that comes later in the movie. While Bowman is out of the Discovery ship, Hal cuts off the life supports for the rest of the crew, but remember that the consoles do have emergency recovery instructions. Now Hal locks Bowman out and the letters M-E-M -E on the computer screens are projected onto Bowman's face along with some other interesting patterns. TVs and monitors don't display light in this way, so it makes no logical sense for it to happen here, though there may be thematic reasons. The word M-E-M -E on the screens is displayed so that it appears across the contours of Bowman's face, so that it reads something else. And note that Bowman keeps repeating the line, Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hal? 
So Boma makes his way inside the ship via the airlock and he puts on a space helmet in a colour which we have hardly seen at all in the movie so far, green. The rigid stationary shots and smooth camera movements that have been used throughout the entire Discovery ship sequence suddenly are replaced by organic, freeform, handheld movement. Bowman heads up and disables Hal's memory, which weirdly involves exposing particular cells. While being shut down, Hal sings the song Daisy Bell, which was the song that was first sung by IBM's first talking computer. And Hal describes himself as being created in the same plant where that same talking computer was created by IBM. I became operational at the HAL plant in Urbana, Illinois. The scene finishes with Hal playing a recording of Floyd making an announcement about a discovery of evidence regarding life off the Earth. Again, no mention of aliens. And Floyd is making that announcement from the same desk and room where they had the council meeting. Remember I said that the walls were basically cinema screens? Well, here they are in action. And still, there has been no direct verbal reference to aliens, so the only thing in the film that really suggests the presence of aliens is the monolith itself. That is, unless the monolith symbolises something else entirely. We also don't get to find out if Bowman uses the emergency revival procedures to save the rest of the crew. Now to the really crazy part of the movie. A monolith of unspecified size floats freely around Jupiter and its moons. The monolith is seen mostly on its side, and threatens to potentially align with the screen itself in some of the shots. Jupiter gradually tilts between shots until we're viewing it at a 90 degree angle, like with the opening shots of the Moon, Earth and Sun. We end up with the monolith perfectly on its side at a 90 degree angle, and tilting back until it disappears, as if it has no actual thickness. The camera tilts up to where the sun ought to be, but instead we enter this seemingly random yet partially geometric set of displays, usually referred to as the Stargate, but it isn't referred to as that in the film. On Floyd's helmet, his pod consoles are reflected, but the Stargate patterns aren't. The Stargate initially has a vertical horizon arrangement, and we get a big splash of the colour green, which is so rare in the movie, and after some displays that are reminiscent of Hal's memory cells, the horizon shifts 90 degrees to a horizontal position. Then, just as the whole screen is about to white out, we get a psychedelic coloured eye and a very pretty explosion. The series of shots that follow are very organic looking, the opposite of the hard-edged rigidness of the Discovery ship living conditions and computer panels, Heartbeat and fetus-like images are in there too, and most of it doesn't look anything like the cosmos. Then we have possibly the weirdest shot in the whole movie. Seven diamonds or octahedrons each seem to have an inverse Stargate tunnel displayed inside of it. And at the very start of the shot, look at the white pattern lower screen that looks quite out of place. Now the Stargate design becomes somewhat like a planetary landscape, and at the end of the shot we get that same geometric design, but it's now flipped to the top of the screen. Next up, the sequence of coloured landscapes. We don't know what planet this is, or whether it's the Earth or the Moon. The rockiness could pass for the Moon, except there are lakes and oceans on it. It's actually stock footage from Kubrick's previous film Dr. Strangelove. Seems like quite a lazy special effect considering the detailed effort that went into the rest of the movie. And these landscapes aren't mentioned in the novel. Actually, very few of the things that I'm talking about in this video are mentioned in the novel. And onto the weird room sequence. The displays in the pod say non-function, so formal, computerised mathematical logic doesn't apply here. Is it a dream? Bowman, all shook up, starts seeing himself from a third position as he gets older. Instead of windows, there are paintings, art being something lacking in the high-tech worlds Bowman has been living in. Strange voices utter some sort of dialect or music that is unfamiliar. The film and crew itself are very clearly visible in Bowman's helmet here and one of the people on the set moves his hand during the shot. 
The technological aspects of Bowman's astronaut life start disappearing. The pod is gone, then his suit is gone. There's a real toilet instead of an anti-gravity one. He eats real food and seems to have mostly eaten the meat and just a bit of veg. In the bathroom mirror, which is the very first mirror prop in the whole movie, it seems that we're seeing Bowman's reflection in close-up, but the tube in his neck flips sides, so we're actually seeing him from the other side of the mirror. And when he turns his head, we can see that the doorway back into the bedroom is reflected on the wrong side of his helmet. Again, we're viewing Bowman from the other side of the mirror. The dinner table, bed and some other items are coloured in green or brown, natural colours that are hardly ever present in the Discovery ship's techno design. And that floor pattern of lit tiles was present on the centrifuge ship earlier, except it was a ceiling. Bowman smashes a glass by accident, and one of the things that this moment establishes is that Bowman is existing in a place that has full gravity equivalent to Earth's. Then he sees his older self in bed. This is the first time we see two versions of him shown on screen at once. So he's now sleeping in a natural bed instead of the dreamless hypersleep of the Discovery ship beds. We can hear his natural breathing instead of the assisted breathing heard in some of the space shots. The monolith reappears, and when he reaches out to it, his finger comes within an inch or two of touching it. If we think of the screen in terms of a flat 2D perspective, which is what movies actually are. And at the same time, the camera has shifted for the first time to a position outside the room itself, which previously appeared to have no exit. The conceptual fourth wall of the film set has been broken. The monolith becomes the doorway out, Bowman is reborn and adopting his point of view, we move into the monolith as the set pushes away on either sides like a set of curtains. The enlightened baby looks at a fully lit earth and turns to look directly at us. And finally the end titles contain some more clues. The words, the end, don't appear until after the cast and crew credits. The music then carries on over an empty black screen for an additional four and a half minutes. I can't think of any other movie where that happens. So there you have it. A whole bunch of clues to help you start figuring out the conceptual depths of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now that isn't all of the clues. There are many, many more in the film, probably hundreds, maybe even thousands. So uh, go and study the film for yourself as well and find out what else you can notice. If you're interested in my take on how all of these puzzle clues fit together, then I suggest you go check out my video, Meaning of the Monolith Revealed. That one it will give you a big step forward in breaking down the movie. Um, also, you can go to my website, collativelearning.com, and check out my 14 chapter analysis of uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, a fairly in-depth one there which will again break down much of the film for you, at least I think it does anyway. Um, and I also have several other videos on 2001 as well because th there's so much going on in that movie, such a complex production history. For those of you who are new to my work, if you enjoyed this then subscribe, check out my videos, I've got tons more stuff here. And go to my website where you'll find a ton of uh, free articles, very in-depth articles about Kubrick films and other movies, uh, and a ton of digital downloads as well, which you have to pay for, but you can download them straight to your hard drive and keep the videos and then they're yours forever. I've got a huge backlog of stuff there, probably about 80-85% of my material is offline. Um, I've also got a second YouTube channel here just called Rob Eger. Uh, I split my film analysis videos between those two channels, so make sure to subscribe to both. Thanks for watching, folks, and take it easy.